There are nearly two million known species of wild animals, but the vast majority have never been farmed. Most insects and rodents are of no practical use to humans and not worth the effort of farming. Some birds, fish, and reptiles have been domesticated, but most are simply impractical to farm. So are most carnivores, not because they're dangerous, but because you'd have to grow other animals just to feed them. The best animals to farm are large, plant-eating mammals. And over the years, humans have probably tried to domesticate all of them, usually without success. Despite repeated efforts, Africans have never domesticated the elephant. In South Asia, some elephants are used as work animals, but they're not farmed for the purpose. Instead, each elephant is caught in the wild and then tamed and trained. It doesn't make economic sense to farm an animal that takes some 15 years to mature and reach an age where it can start reproducing. Animals which make suitable candidates for domestication can start giving birth in their first or second years. They will have one or maybe two offspring a year, so their productivity is actually high. Behaviorally, they need to be social animals, meaning that the males and the females and the young all live together as a group, and they also have an internal social hierarchy, which means that if humans can control the leader, then they will also gain control over a whole herd or a whole flock. There is another crucial requirement for a domestic animal. It needs to get along with humans. Some animals don't have the temperament to live on a farm. A zebra could be an ideal domestic animal, potentially as useful as a horse. But evolving in the midst of Africa's great predators, Zebras have become flighty, nervous creatures. They have a vicious streak that humans have been unable to tame. That may be why zebras have never been harnessed to a plow or ridden into battle. I counted up 148 different species of wild, plant-eating, terrestrial mammals that weigh over 100 pounds. But of those 148, the number that have ever been successfully farmed for any length of time is just 14. Goats, sheep, pigs, cows, horses, donkeys, Bactrian camels, Arabian camels, water buffalo, llamas, reindeer, yaks, Mithans and Bali cattle. Just 14 large domestic animals in 10,000 years of domestication. And where did the ancestors of these animals come from? None was from New Guinea or Australia or Sub-Saharan Africa or the whole continent of North America. South America had the ancestor of just one large domestic animal, the llama. The other 13 were all from Asia, North Africa, and Europe. And of these, the big four livestock animals, cows, pigs, sheep, and goats, were native to the Middle East. The very same area that was home to some of the best crops in the world was also home to some of the best animals. Little wonder that this area became known as the Fertile Crescent. The people of the Fertile Crescent were geographically blessed, with access to some of the best crops and farm animals in the ancient world.
it gave them a huge head start. What had begun with the sowing of wheat and the penning of goats was leading towards the first human civilization. The archaeological site of Guer in southern Jordan is 9,000 years old. But it has all the hallmarks of a town. A few hundred people lived here in rows of houses that were a wonder of technology. Every time I come here, I'm amazed by what those people were doing. Some of the houses have a kind of air conditioning. Uh, this window here is for, to control the air coming from the street inside the house. And the houses, the walls and the floors of the houses from the inside at least were covered with plaster. So people were moving to the concept of homes. It's, it's not a place just to sleep, it is a proper home, and people started to decorate the houses from the, from, from the inside. And people were started to invest in their homes, because if we are talking about plaster, it is time consuming, it's effort consuming. It's very expensive to have plastered house. As villages grew bigger, there were more people to work on the land. More people could produce more food more efficiently, enough to support specialists within the community. Freed from the burden of farming, some people were able to develop new skills and new technologies. Making plaster from limestone was a major technological breakthrough. The stones had to be heated for days at a time, at a temperature of a thousand degrees. It may seem insignificant today, but understanding how to work with fire was the first step towards forging steel, a technology that would transform the world. By contrast, places like New Guinea never developed advanced technology. Even today, some people in the highlands are working in ways that have barely changed for centuries. When I first came to New Guinea in the 1960s, people were still using stone tools like this axe in parts of the island. And before European arrival, people were using stone tools everywhere in New Guinea. So why didn't New Guinea develop metal tools by itself? And eventually I realized that to have metalworking specialists who can figure out how to smelt copper and iron requires that the rest of the people in the society who are farmers be able to generate enough food surpluses to feed them. But New Guinea agriculture was not productive enough to generate those food surpluses. And the result was no specialists, no metal workers, no metal tools.